not my home I am just passing through Earthly treasure soon will fade But I found my hope in you You are the one I want You are the one I need This work can have it all The only lasting thing is you. You are forever. You are forever. You are the one that I run to. Cause you are my treasure. You are my treasure. Cause the only lasting thing is you. Cause you are forever. You are forever. You are the one that I run to. Come on, lift it up in the room. Others may fail, but you remain. Hey, cause you are my treasure. You are my treasure.
is not my home. I am just passing through. Earthly treasures soon will fade, but I found my hope in you. You are the one I want. You are the one I need. This world can have it. Love 
today. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus.
beautiful. He is wonderful. Hallelujah. We lift you up, God. We lift you up. Come into this place today, God. Come invade this place. Invade this space, God. We want more of you. We want more of you, Jesus.
says there is no other name given no other name given that we're going to found, find salvation in forgiveness in understanding from there's no other name it's the greatest name every knee shall bow that's the word now if you've come to this place and think we're making a little too much of Jesus you might not fit here because he's everything to us. He is everything. He's the one who died, shed his blood. That's what we baptize in. That's what we anoint and pray for people with. The Bible says in everything, word and deed, do in the name of Jesus. And this is our time where we take a moment and ask you, if you have a need in your body, in your life, in your family, in your marriage that you would like us to pray with you for, then come down here and we will anoint you with oil and we will believe that Jesus is going to meet the need. Let me tell you why we know that and believe that is because so many good things have happened at this time in our services. Miracles, answering of prayers. Church, do you know that to be true? It is absolutely true. So whatever you need, and if it's someone that's afar off, we'll anoint a prayer cloth that you can send to them. We've seen cancers healed. We've seen miracles occur. This is not magic. This is miracle. By the name of Jesus, by the power of the Holy Ghost, in Jesus' name. Church, let's pray right now in Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you. We believe in you, dear God. We trust in you. Thank you for the privilege, dear God, to come before the throne and ask for our needs and petitions. You, dear God, for the goodness that you can provide to us, Lord. Let your mercy, let your grace, let your power and your glory, dear God, be manifested to him, Lord Jesus. That everything that needs to be done in your name, dear God, be done. We ask it in your holy and precious name. Thank you, dear God, for the opportunity to approach the throne. Thank you, Lord Jesus. You said to do it with boldness. your precious name. Thank you for the privilege, Lord Jesus. Thank you for the opportunity, Lord Jesus. We believe in you, mighty God. We trust in you, Jesus. Oh, we magnify that holy Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Let your glory, Lord God, be a part of the day, Lord Jesus. Let your mercy be a part of the day, Lord God. Whatever the you throughout this place, Lord God. That's the honor, Lord Jesus. thank the Lord for his healing power, for his provision and his grace. God, you've been so good to us, Lord. We thank you for the miraculous that has been in operation in our church. We thank you for the many healing miracles that we have seen in the last several weeks. And we pray, Lord, that all these needs would be met today. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. 
Turn to your neighbor and say, welcome to the Pentecostal church. We're so glad that you're here. We're glad you could join us in person. We're glad you could join us online. There is no place we would rather be on a Sunday morning. Amen? We do have some announcements today. They have changed since last week, so you're going to want to listen to these ones. First, and always first, prayer tomorrow night at 7 p.m. We are having the most incredible prayer meetings right here in the prayer room. Everybody is invited. We're calling these Miracle Mondays. We've been seeing God do awesome things in our Monday prayer meetings. You don't want to miss them. If you are at all able to get here from work, from whatever your obligations are, we want to see you in the prayer room tomorrow at 7 p.m. Who here likes food? Oh, come on. Every hand ought to be up in the air. I know Pentecostals. We love to eat. Don't lie in the house of God. We want to invite everybody to stay after church for our chili cook-off. There have been brothers and sisters. There's one pounding his chest like an ape over here. We got Tarzan the Chili Man up on the platform. We want you to stay and vote for the best chili. Winner gets bragging rights for the next year. We're going to have tables and chairs set up, bowls and spoons, and all the accoutrements for you to have chili on this cold, blustery day. This is the year of fellowship, amen? Amen. So we want you to stay and eat with us. Mark your calendars. The 26th of this month, evangelist Caleb Herring is going to be with us. We are anticipating a mighty move of God. He is used in the gift of prophecy. We're believing that God is going to show up and show out in a big way. So be inviting your friends, your neighbors. We want everybody to be here on March 26th. Easter Sunday. There are three services a year that we do not miss. If we're sick, we get healed. If we're dead, we get raised. Because we don't miss Easter Sunday. Amen? It's a holy day, not a holiday. Holiday. Forget the bunnies and the eggs. And I love me some peeps. I'm going to kill some of those marshmallow monstrosities before it's all said and done. But it's not about marshmallows. It's about Jesus rising again. (laughs) Invite your friends. Invite your neighbors. If you've seen our ad on Facebook and Instagram, share it. Put it in your stories. Spread it through the neighborhood. We want everybody who can to be here Easter Sunday to celebrate. If you received a slip from Sister LaPree regarding donations to help us fund our Easter efforts, please have those in by March 26th. Young people. Youth convention. Now, I'm old enough to remember when you mentioned youth convention that kids lost their ever-loving minds. That was kind of weak, guys. Let me try that again, okay? Youth convention. All right, that's better. That's better. April 12th. In Visalia, we are going to be at Youth Convention from Wednesday through Saturday. You do not want to miss this incredible event tailored for young people. We have one of the biggest youth conventions in the country. It is well done. It is well put on. We have great speakers. If you have any questions about youth convention, see Brother Cameron or Sister Anna. They will happily provide you with all the information because that's what they do. Ladies, there is a tea coming up for you on April 29th. That is, I'm not a lady, so I got about as excited as that. You guys have tea, you enjoy it. But apparently this is something that's really fun for ladies. So if you want to be there, please see Sister Michael for details regarding our ladies' tea on April 29th. If you did not get a pledge card for the special offering that we took pledges for at our business meeting, If you have no idea what I'm talking about and you go to this church, please come see me after service. We want to make sure that we meet our $25,000 commitment by the end of May. We want to be a church that does not have debt. I don't want to be a church that's always having to ask for money to pay for everything. So let's get this done. Let's get it out of the way. It's very important that it's done by the end of May. So if you've not got a pledge card, get one, turn it in, and have your funds in by the end of May. Finally... Core Conference. Now, I'm excited because 
God's making me plan core conference. So we're having core conference. It is an incredible opportunity. If you are a member of this church or you are, have recently started attending and you are interested in any of the technical ministries, whether it is projection or live streaming, sound, video, photography, social media, church branding, there are so many facets of things that go on behind the scenes that nobody sees until the lyrics don't come up on the wall in a timely manner. And then we all see it and we're going, how's that song go? I don't remember. Brother Caden, quick, somebody put those up on the wall. We are bringing experts from all over the state of California. We've got one coming from Ohio to teach and educate those who are interested in the technical ministries. And we're not just doing it for our church. We want everybody who's interested in those ministries to register and come. But we are doing this to bless our district. There are so many churches of our size in the range of 50 to 250 that have teams of people that are just doing their best. And we want to honor them, we want to bless them, and we want to teach them everything that we've learned and send them home so they can be a bigger blessing to their church. Amen? Amen. So we want you to attend core conference. If at all possible, it's going to be a great time. Why don't we worship with the choir as they sing? Jehovah seated on the throne, Abba, Father, the well that overflows, the God who was and is and shall be.
Oh, let's dwell for a moment in the sweetness of his presence. Jesus, we're so thankful that you're here. We thank you, Lord, for your spirit. We thank you for your presence, God. Oh, we're so grateful that you want to be in the midst of us today. Oh, come on, church. Lift your hands and worship the King. He's worthy of our praise. Hallelujah. the highest praise. Oh. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. The presence of the Lord is here. I believe He's here on purpose and for a reason. Pastor regretted not being able to be here today. At the last minute, he was called in to help a friend, Brother Nielsen, pastor at East Valley in San Jose. Uh, he strongly felt he needed to answer the call for assistance to fill in and preach today. We're thankful that our pastor can go and minister to other churches. Amen. Amen. He is a great prophet and a mighty man of God, and we get to share him with other people. So we're thankful for that. Uh, he will be here Wednesday, I believe. Um, we want to be here for church on Wednesday night, whether he's here or not. Amen. Amen. I have come this morning with a heavy burden. The Lord started speaking to me at men's conference on Thursday night while Brother Hill was introducing our first speaker, and he began to lay out what he wanted me to say today. And then I watched as every preacher for the next two days stepped all over all of it and preached a whole bunch of the same things, but there is something in here the Lord has for us today. He is reaching for somebody. He is calling for someone to hear his word. I'm asking that we be open to the voice of the Lord today. If you have your Bibles, I'll be taking my text today from the book of Genesis chapter 5. Genesis chapter 5, beginning in verse number 12. And as I look at that chapter, it's Genesis chapter 6, not 5. I wrote that down incorrectly. Genesis chapter 6, beginning in verse number 12, it says, And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me. For the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Rooms shalt thou make in the ark, and shalt pitch it within and without with pitch. And this is the fashion which thou shalt make it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, and the breadth of it 50 cubits, and the height of it 30 cubits. A window shalt thou make in the ark, and a cubit shalt thou finish it above. And the door of the ark shalt thou, shalt thou set in the side thereof with lower, second, and third stories shalt thou make it. And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh wherein is the breath of life. From under heaven and everything that is in the earth shall die. But with thee will I establish my covenant, and thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons and thy wife, and thy sons' wives with thee. 
I want to take my text today from verse number 14, where it says, Make thee an ark of gopher wood. And I want to preach for the next few moments on this subject. Build an ark. Build an ark. Why don't we set our Bibles to the side and lift our hands one more time and ask the Lord to speak to us today. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for your presence and your spirit that is in this place. You have moved in such a sweet and tender way, and you are wanting to speak to us, God. You're wanting to touch your people and guide us in your way and in your will. We pray this morning that you would anoint our minds and our hearts and our ears, that we would be able to receive your word, God, that it would burrow itself down deep inside of us, that we would receive it and let it begin to change us as you will. We thank you, Lord, for all you've done. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Now, the time that Noah lived in was a very interesting one. It was a time before the law. Most of us, when we think of the Old Testament, we think of Mosaic law and sacrifice and the tabernacle. But Noah existed in a space between the fall of Adam and Eve and God beginning his relationship with Abraham. In Noah's age, people did whatever was good in their own sight. They didn't have a law to follow. They didn't have rules to live by. They didn't have guidance from God on how to live or limits placed on their conscience. With no guiding force in their lives beside the influence of sin, the world began to, come and began to become incredibly wicked. Verse 12 of our text says that God looked upon the earth and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. If we jump back just a few verses in Genesis chapter 6 to verses 5 through 7, it says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and creeping thing and the fowls of the air. For it repenteth me that I have made them. Every imagination and thought in the heart of man was evil continually. They didn't take a break and have church on a Sunday. They were evil continually. It had gotten so bad that the Lord regretted having made man at all. This companion that he had created for himself, this unique being of free will fashioned in his own image, managed to get so far from the original design that he wanted to erase it completely. One of the things that I find interesting here is that it wasn't just man that was going to pay for all of that sin. In verse 7, God says he's going to destroy man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air. God's anger at man's sin burned so hot that all of the earth was going to suffer collateral damage. That's the thing about sin, though. Sin never just harms the person committing it. That's why there are no victimless crimes. Don't tell, don't let people convince you there are victimless crimes. Somebody always gets hurt. Whether it's the store owner that now has to deal with the insurance company hoping amongst all hope that they're going to get reimbursed for what was stolen. Or the people whose homes and goods have been damaged or broken or taken away. There is always a victim. Sin has collateral damage. When somebody fornicates and then decides they don't want to be with that person anymore, there's collateral damage. When a baby is conceived that isn't wanted and the parent chooses to end that innocent life, that's collateral damage. When we lie to our spouse and to our kids to cover up a drinking problem, 
a pornography addiction or infidelity, that's collateral damage. Sin always has a price that needs to be paid. The bill is always due. Romans chapter 6 and verse number 23. Romans 6 and 23 says, For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We like to gloss over the first part of that verse because we love the grace of God. We need His mercy. We're hungry for eternal life. But the wages of sin is death. Sin demands death as collateral. Even though the gift of God grants us eternal life, this body still must die. It's why we have to lean on the grace of God and utilize the power of the Holy Ghost to live a godly and holy life. We don't want to leave a trail of collateral damage in our wake. With the world being in the state that it was, God decides he has no other choice. He can't stand the look and the stench of it anymore. He looks across the entirety of humanity on the earth and he finds one man, Noah. Genesis chapter 6, verses 8 and 9. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. There was something about Noah that caused God to pause on him. In the King James translation, it says that he was a just man. But what does that mean? Let's look at the Amplified Version for some additional information. Genesis 6 and 9 in the Amplified says, These are the records of the generations, family history of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, one who was just and had right standing with God, blameless in his evil generation. Noah walked lived in habitual fellowship with God. There are a few things here. Number one, Noah had a good standing with God. He was blameless in his evil generation. But more than that, he had a habit of fellowshipping with God. There is so much to unpack here that I could preach for hours, but for the sake of brevity, I want to condense it down. It wasn't that Noah was a perfect man because no man is perfect. Show me a man and I'll show you an imperfect one. I don't care how many titles and records and letters he has around his name. He is an imperfect man. But Noah had a habitual relationship with God that allowed him to have right standing with his creator. That meant that he spent time with God on a regular basis. He had a reliable relationship with the Lord. Now, as our nation and our world becomes increasingly wicked, we find ourselves in a space not unlike Noah. The sin of this world is rising like the stink of a roadkill on a hot August afternoon into the nostrils of God. Men are doing whatever is right in their own eyes. They're rejecting God and righteousness as fairy tale and fancy, calling it oppression as they destroy the very fabric of what is decent and good in their rush to fulfill their own lusts. It's in this environment that God is searching for righteous men and women. People who have a habitual relationship with him. He's not looking for people that only acknowledge God when they want something. Oh God, I need money this week and then they walk away and we don't see him again for months. He's not looking for people that turn to him when the world is upside down, but as soon as he writes it for them, they're out the door. He's looking for those that desire relationship. There are those here today who have found grace in the sight of the Lord. He has allowed you of all places everywhere in the world to be in this church on a Sunday morning. 
Because he sees something in you. He's longing to have a relationship with you. He's calling you out of a world that is filled with wickedness and sorrow and depravity. And he is drawing you into the closeness of his grace and the warmth of his love and the peace of his presence. He's calling you to know who he is and build an ark. The church and the world have been lulled into a false sense of security. It's been thousands of years since Jesus ascended into heaven and promised he was coming back. After a while, we all just stopped worrying about it. We kept pushing it farther and farther into the future. Maybe one of these generations, Jesus will come. I want to look at Matthew 24, verses 38 and 39. Matthew 24, 38 and 39. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. It took Noah about 100 years to build the ark. It's a pretty serious construction project. Day after day, year after year, he erected a monument that warned of God's coming judgment. There was nothing else it could be. Nobody had ever seen it rain. It's going to flood? Yeah, right. What's that? But he built it anyway. As neighbors no doubt mocked him and over time just ignored him, Noah toiled on the ark. Board by board, beam by beam, he constructed the object of his salvation under the guidance of the Lord in the face of the indifference of his world. And then one day, unexpectedly, without warning, he'd been talking about it for a hundred years. Water began to fall and rise. But by then it was too late. The door of the ark was sealed. There was no way to get in, no ladders, no climbing equipment, no back doors. I believe as the water levels rose, they beat on that door. They cried. They screamed. They begged, let us in! And with the sounds of a dying world echoing in their ears, Noah and his family rose above the flood. Just like Noah tried to warn others that judgment was coming, I'm here this afternoon to tell everybody under the sound of my voice, Jesus is coming. It may take five seconds, five minutes, five hours, five days, I don't know, but Jesus is coming. It's not something far off in the future. It's not fairy tales we tell to scare our children. Jesus is coming. And it's a lot sooner than we think. We need to start building an ark so that we can be ready for his return. What does that mean, Pastor Matt? You mean I need to build a big old boat in my backyard? Go steal the giraffes from the nearest zoo? No. I'm not talking about a physical ark. I'm talking about a spiritual one. Noah didn't build his without instruction. And we're not going to be building ours without it either. Look with me in Genesis 6 and verses 14 and 16. The Lord tells Noah, make thee an ark of gopher wood. Room shalt thou make in the ark, and shalt pitch it within and without with pitch. 
And this is the fashion which thou shalt make of it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, the breadth of it 50 cubits, and the height of it 30 cubits. Window shalt thou make at the, to the ark, and in a cubit shalt thou finish it above. And the door of the ark shalt thou set in the side thereof with lower, second, and third stories shalt thou make it. God starts Noah's instructions with the basic material he needs to do the job. Gopher wood. The Lord understands that when you build an ark, you've got to start with the basics. After all, he didn't just tell Noah, hey, go build a really big boat. However you want to, just make it happen. He made sure Noah had the foundation first. Much like Noah's foundation, we have the material for our own ark already. In Acts chapter 2 and verse number 38, Simon Peter stood up and said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Basic building blocks. The gopher wood for the modern ark. It's the fabric of what we build on today. In John 3 and 5, Jesus told Nicodemus that unless you're born again of water and of spirit, you can't enter into the kingdom of heaven. Simon Peter got up and elaborated on the day of Pentecost, letting the world know what being born again of water and spirit means. This is our gopher wood. We must repent. We must be baptized in the name of Jesus. And we must be filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost. It's our material. There are a lot of folks out there that have different ideas about that. They, they, they don't like it. It feels too restrictive. They want to tell you that Christianity is a big tent and we're all taking different roads toward the same destination. But my friends, that's not Bible. That's not backed by the Word of God. It is nowhere in all 66 books. You can't find it. There is only one material to build from. In Matthew chapter 7 and verses 13 and 14. Matthew 7, 13 and 14. Enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. I don't mean to stand here in condemnation of any man or woman. I don't come today to offend anyone though the gospel can be offensive. I love everybody, and I wouldn't hurt a person, man, woman, child, for all the world. I am sitting here as the mouthpiece of God today, telling you that your ark must be built out of a specific material if you want it to float. Noah couldn't build it out of oak. He couldn't build it out of maple because he liked the look and the feel of it better. It had to be gopher wood. And it has to be repentance and baptism in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins and the infilling of the Holy Ghost. Straight is the gate. Narrow is the way. He's coming soon. And we've got to build an ark. After letting him know what materials he was going to need to gather, God continues to give instruction or instruction for the ark. It needed to have rooms inside and be pitched within and without. Now, did that mean that he needed to get the MLB Major League lineup and have them run drills inside and outside? No. 
Pitch was a substance that sealed against leaks and water damage. It was a protective material that not only kept water out, but acted as a defensive layer as well. Once we start building our ark with our foundational material, we've got to seal it to make sure it's not damaged by the elements. What does that look like? Look with me in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. Wherefore, seeing we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. When we're building an ark, we've got to check it for leaks. We need to remove the pieces of wood that have rotted before we could get the pitch On them. We've got to make sure that every hole is sealed before the rains come. Even filled with the Holy Ghost, it's possible that if we're not careful, sin could work its way through the seams and leak on down the inside of the ark and start to pool in the bottom and pull the ark down. So we start laying aside weights. And the sins that so easily beset us. We have to take a long, hard look at the things that we allow to influence our lives. What sort of media are we consuming? Are the apps that we're using on our devices drawing us nearer to God? Or causing us to crave sin? Can we use Facebook without gossip? Can we be on Instagram without lust? Oh, Brother Matt, that's some extremist preaching right there. Is it, though? I'm not getting up here telling you what you can have on your phone. That's between you and God. I'm simply asking you to determine, is this a weight? Is it lifting me up as the waters rise? Or is it dragging me down? Into the depths where I'll drown. Is this causing me to crave God? Or crave the world? What is this making me want to do? Is it a weight? Is this a leak in my ark? Is this going to let water in when the wind is blowing and the waves are crashing? What's even the point of building an ark if we don't build it with anti-sinking technology? What are your weights? What are the sins that you're easily drawn toward? We've all got them. So we have to identify them and begin to seal the ark against it. Fill the cracks. Plug the holes, replace the rotted boards, make sure that the ark is going to float. I can't let anything in. Because the day of the Lord is coming. The waters are coming. And I don't want to let anything keep me from rising into the sky when he returns. With the building materials set, and our sealant identified. God provides the greatest level of detail for the size, scope, and construction of the ark. In Genesis 6 and 15 and 16, he says, and this is the fashion which thou shalt make of it. This is how you're going to build it. This is how it needs to look. The length of the ark needs to be 300 cubits. It's got to be 50 cubits wide and 30 cubits high you got to put a window in it that's only a cubit 
and finish it right above. And the door needs to be set on the side. And there needs to be three stories to this thing. When you build an ark, it's got to be the right size and shape. You don't build an ark for one. You're trying to fit people in there. It has to be able to contain everything required to sustain you until the flood is over. Knowing that he was going to destroy everything on earth, God made sure his instructions included accommodation for all of the animals, food, and people who were going to be preserved inside. Just like God provided Noah with guidance to preserve life against his judgment, He's also giving us guidance on how to preserve ourselves and our families in preparation of his coming. Look with me in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We're going to read verses 2 through 24. It's long, but hold on. 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse number 2 says, For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as what? A thief in the night. Nobody knows. As soon as XYZ preacher gets up and starts saying, God is coming at this date and this time. Mark it down. He's not coming. Nobody knows. And there's a reason. Because we've got to be ready. He doesn't want us laying around, basking in the sun, enjoying sin, and then he says, I'm going to be here in six days. We go, well, I better get right then. I've been living like a devil for 57 years, but I might as well get right right now. Let me look at my watch. Ten minutes till Jesus comes. Lord, forgive me. I can smoke one more in there. Three minutes. God, forgive me. He's coming as a thief in the night. We don't know when. We just know he's coming. He's coming, and he's coming quick, and he's coming quiet, and when it happens, they're going to be looking around going, what was that? Verse number three, for when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. The world can deny it. They can say, oh, peace and prosperity. Everything's fine. Banks are falling apart. It's nothing to worry about here. Countries are attacking to each other. Don't worry about that. Peace. It's all good. Peace and safety. They can pretend it's not happening. But dark days are coming. Destruction is coming. And when it comes, it comes suddenly. It comes quickly. It falls and it rains terror all over mankind. And then we look around and go, what happened? Verse number four tells us, but ye brethren are not in darkness. That that day should overtake you as a thief. We're not supposed to be taking a nap. We're not sitting around with the lights off. We're supposed to be ready so that his coming doesn't catch us off guard. So that when that trumpet sounds, we're not going, oh, no. We have the biggest smile on our face as we rise into the heavens. As the dead in Christ rise first, and then all of those of us that remain ascend behind them, and we come into the glory of his promises. Because we were ready. Verse number five says, Ye are all the children of the light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch. Watch and be sober. Is he coming today? Am I ready? Can I afford to walk out of the church today with issues in my heart that are unresolved? Can I walk out there and eat chili with sin in my life and not worry about it? 
Verse number 7. For they that sleep, sleep in the night. And they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet the hope of salvation. Brothers, sisters, he is coming. Wipe the sleep out of your eyes. Wake up and see that Jesus is coming and he's coming soon. I've got to be ready. My family's got to be ready. Everybody I know and that I love has got to be ready. For God hath not appointed us to wrath. He doesn't want us to suffer, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another. Lift each other up. Be there for your brother. When a brother or sister falls, don't write them off. Don't throw them out. Don't kick them out the door. Lift them up again. Heal them. Restore them. Lift each other up. Edify one another. Bring as many into the ark as we can grab. Come with me. And we beseech you, brethren. To know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. And to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. And be at peace among yourselves. Now we exhort you, brethren. Warn them that are unruly. Comfort the feeble-minded. Support the weak. Be patient toward all. Men, my wife taught this morning so good, and she started teaching things I was going to say, and I thought, well, but God. We don't get out there on social media and say, you dummy, you idiot. What's wrong with you? Does your brain don't work? There, there, and there. Your and your. Get it right. Grammar. No. My politics are better than your politics. No. We're there for others. Exhort others. Comfort others. Support the weak and be patient toward all men. That means when your brother in the church offends you, You don't leave in a huff. You patiently make it right. Verse number 15. See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good both among yourselves and to all men. You know why God says vengeance is mine? Because we're not supposed to be in the vengeance business. It's not our job to walk around condemning everybody and telling them, hey, you're not holy enough. Behold my glory. You ought to be as righteous as me. That's not my job. When my brother offends me, it's not my job to try and hurt him worse. When I'm arguing with my wife, it's not my job to see how bad I can rip her down so I can win. When my wife's arguing with me, it's not her job to try and emasculate me so she can prove a point. A little free marriage counseling for you. We don't render evil for evil. Verse number 16. Rejoice evermore. We ought to be the happiest people in the world. There is nothing more discouraging 
than bummed out, miserable, unhappy Pentecostals. They are the most terrible people to be around. You know why? Because they've been saved. They've been forgiven. They've been filled with the Holy Ghost. God's hand is on their life. They've been pulled out of the wickedness of sin. They've been delivered from addiction and oppression and depression and anxiety. And then they're walking around going, Rejoice evermore. When we don't get our way, rejoice. When God's answer to our prayer is no, rejoice. When his will is different from my will, rejoice. And then what? Pray without ceasing. I come to prayer on Monday nights. But then the only thing I say to God between Monday and Sunday is thank you, Jesus, for this food. Pray without ceasing. Prayer doesn't take vacations. Prayer doesn't have a do not disturb function. We have to pray continually, day in and day out, until the day of his return. Because we want to be ready. We're building an ark for the Zion. We're using the gopher wood, and and we're putting pitch on it, and we're setting it at the right height and width and length, and we've got to be praying all the way. Verse number 18 In everything, give thanks. I can stop right there. We ought to be thankful, yeah? But the verse doesn't stop right there. It says, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. God's will is that we're thankful. In the midst of bad situations, we're thankful. When God is blessing us, we're thankful. When everything's going my way, I'm thankful. When everything's going wrong, I'm thankful. When I'm mad, when I'm sad, when I'm hungry, when I'm full, I'm thankful. If we are living in a state of an ever unending lust for more, we are not Thankful. We must have thankfulness. Verse number 19, quench not the spirit. What does that mean? Don't hinder the move of God in your life. Yield to the spirit when he speaks to you. When God tells you, hey, that's a weight. You don't need that. Put that away. But I like it, God. Put it away. How am I going to get the news with that? I don't care. Don't quench the spirit. Some of us wonder why we never hear from God. Because every time he tries to speak, we go, yeah, volume down. My truck's got a mute button on the stereo. My wife and I don't like the same music. So as soon as we get in my truck, mute, Don't treat the Holy Ghost like that. Don't treat God's spirit like that. I'm sorry, God. I don't like you. Mute. You you really need to put this away. Mute. I feel conviction. Mute. Quench not the spirit. These are instructions for building an ark. Verse number 20. Despise not prophesying. Don't ignore what God says through prophecy and his word. When the pastor gets up and he starts to prophesy, you can't write that off and go, ah, it's just pastor. He's got low blood sugar today. Brother Matt's up here warning that Jesus is coming. Ah, that just didn't hit me in the right spot. I want some chili. Then I'll get some real heartburn. 
Don't ignore when God speaks. Verse number 21. Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. What does that mean? Put doctrines to the test. Does it stand up to his word? Is it in there? Can I find it? Can you show it to me? If you say that this is doctrine, you better be able to show me chapter, verse, and location, and more than once. Prove it. Prove all things. Name it and claim it. Prove it. Prosperity. Prove it. Show me everything that I believe. Every word that I speak over this pulpit, I have ripped it to pieces. I have pulled out my Bible. I have looked into commentaries. I have torn it all. And I am here today because I could prove it. Because I could see it in the word of God. And I could go to the Lord in prayer and he could confirm it. And I could see it in operation in the world that I live in. Don't be afraid to prove doctrine. I love what our pastor says. You better have a relationship with your Bible in case I get off. Because it's not my fault if your family doesn't make it. Whose fault is it? Did I know? Could I tell? Could I prove? Verse number 22. Ooh. This one's going to burn a little bit, guys. So let me get the neosporin. Ah. Uh, abstain from all appearance of evil. Your boat's got to be this wide. The ark's got to be this tall. It's got to have this many rooms. What do people see me doing on the internet? What am I liking, following, and endorsing with my shares? Brethren, if I go and I look at your Instagram right now and it is full of cheerleaders and lingerie models and bikini-clad women, what are you telling me? But they're my friend in real life. Sure. I bet they're friends for $20 a month. <laughs> Ladies, that big buff shirtless dude that you're always liking posts on Instagram, and I can tell because I keep seeing big buff shirtless dudes in my feed. Liked by. Oh, did you know that happens? Liked by. Everybody's pulling out their phone right now. What did I like? But Brother Matt, he's a great meal prepper. Yeah. He's bouncing those pecs back and forth prepping his meal, I'm sure. That's what you're eating. It's funny. But it's real. Those are weights. That's an appearance of evil. How can I walk up to my neighbor, Brother Zion, and say, you need to live a godly and holy life? And then they look at my Instagram and go, well. Boy, that looks righteous. Abstain from the appearance of evil. Verse number 23 and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved. Build an ark. Why do we build an ark? To be preserved. Blameless unto the coming of the Lord Jesus 
Christ. My friends, God is calling us to build an ark. He's calling us to build an ark in our lives. To start putting the gopher wood in its proper place. To start pitching it on the outside and on the inside. And to follow the measurements. So that when he comes soon, we're ready I feel so strongly that his coming is near. Pastor asked me Thursday afternoon, Brother Matt, I've got, I've got a thing, and, and Brother Nielsen needs my help, and I feel like I need to go. And I got, I'm, I'm like, I've got men's conference to plan. That's a lot of work. But as I stood there in the presence of God on Thursday night and said, Lord, what is your will for Sunday? The only thing I heard was build an ark. We need to build an ark. Here's the scriptures. This is what I want you to say. We must build an ark. Build it now. Build it today. Don't wait until the waters start to rise. Build the ark. We've got to stop playing with the world. Got to stop thinking we can dip our little toe in there, get just a little bit wet. By the time the waters are rising, it's already too late. Build an ark. Build an ark. Brethren, we've got to lead our families in righteousness. You heard it all weekend at men's conference. We've got to lead our families. Sisters, they, we need your help. We need your support. We can't do it without you. We've, we've got to come together as husbands and wives and families and build an ark. It took all of Noah's family. <laughs> Building, toiling, constructing. We have to build on the foundation of the plan of salvation. We've got to seal our homes against the influence of sin and make room for God to put things he wants to preserve inside. I invite our musicians to come as I begin to close. I'm not a hellfire and brimstone preacher. It's not my candy stick. I pray continually that God will use me to bless people, save people, draw people unto him in an uplifting way. I believe in grace. I live by his mercy. Yet there is a heaviness on me in the spirit. I grip this pulpit trying not to dig my fingernails into the wood. There is a hell to avoid. There is a day of judgment coming. God's not going to be able to abide the sin of this world much longer. And when he's had enough... He's going to call his people home. Is our ark ready? Are we prepared to join him in the sky on the day of judgment? Let me tell you what happens when he comes. On that day, they're going to start banging on the doors of the churches. everywhere they're going to break the locks and they're going to rush through lobbies and they're going to fling themselves at the altar begging for redemption but they're not going to find any 
the waters have already started to rise. The door will have been sealed. And his people will already have been lifted. Don't wait until then. Don't be caught unawares. Build an ark. This altar is open. The gopher wood is here. And the pitch is here. And the blueprints are here. Will you build an ark?
It's all about you. It's not about me. And I decrease as you increase. It's all about you. It's not about me. I decrease. 